The Carolina Panthers return to prime time on Monday night football. Can they bounce back from a week one loss and get to one and one? We'll talk about it right here on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Panthers and Locked On Saints. Here is a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is crossover Thursday, so we're here to get you ready for this Sunday's big matchup. And we appreciate you, as always, for making Locked On Panthers and Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. I know it's it's one or the other. It's not both. I completely understand. And today uh, we have our guy, Julian Council, at Julian Council on Twitter X, the app formerly known as Prince, and myself, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson. No law on, on your favorite social media. Here to bring you everything that you need to know about this matchup. Here is part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Don't forget, you can always subscribe and follow for free wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss the latest episodes. Locked on Panthers and Locked on Saints here for you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and sometimes more than that today's episode is a crossover thursday episode which of course is brought to you by our friends at prize picks the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports go to prizepicks.com slash locked on nfl and use the promo code in all lowercase locked on nfl for our first deposit match up to 100 dollars julian and i are going to be taking you through the keys to victory the biggest matchups and of course we're going to start off with the biggest story so julian the Carolina Panthers hosting this one on a Monday night. What's the biggest story for this team heading into this matchup? Other than the Panthers are back in prime time. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I will say this, Ross. I, the Panthers, the last couple seasons, they have played a Saturday night game on the NFL Network against the Green Bay Packers and Aaron right. Rodgers. Rest in peace. Was there with the Packers. Yikes. That doesn't count. They have played Thursday night football games. That also does not count. In my mind, there are two primetime games, the one on Sunday night and the one yes. on Monday night. And the Carolina Panthers agree. are finally back on Monday night football <laughs> after being lost in the wilderness for a couple of years. Unfortunately, they're heading into Monday night football a little banged up. And they've been yeah. banged up since training camp really began as they've had some serious injuries to players that they felt like would be key contributors that are now hampering the team heading into week two after a disappointing week one loss on the road against another division rival in the Atlanta Falcons. The first one, J.C. Horn, comes up lame in the second yep. quarter of that game on Sunday. Apparently, according to head coach Frank Reich, it's a serious hamstring injury, and he's going to be out for a while, an extended period of time. Does that mean he's going to go on IR? Frank Reich wouldn't say whether he's going on IR, but he did say that he will be out for a significant amount of time. The last time we heard that was with Demir Bird, one of their free agent wide receivers, who they placed on IR and then had to do an injury settlement with and currently is sitting at home. So Oof. it feels like J.C. Horn is going to be out for a while, and surgery apparently is on the table. Not a great mm. situation for the Carolina Panthers, former first-round pick, top-10 pick, who's been right. banged up his rookie year, last year, and now after not even two quarters into the season, he's hurt. And that's that's not great. That's not what you want to that's see. A, that. That's a guy, by the way, that the Saints were, were, were trying to trade up into the top 10 to draft. So that's a, that's a really important note for a lot of Saints fans there, too, in terms of the what could have been of all that. Well, unfortunately, a lot of Panther fans probably wish that was the case, as a lot of <laughs> Panther fans have looked at the guy behind J.C. Horn who got drafted, Patrick Sertan, who's been a yes. pro bowler and has not had a serious injury at all for that excellent Denver Broncos defense out west. The second injury that's also hampering the Panthers heading into Monday night football is the starting left guard Brady Christensen went on an IR on Wednesday with a bicep injury. I'm not sure oh. how serious it is. Obviously, it's serious yeah. enough for him to be out for the next four games. I Typically, when those happen, you don't see guys back the rest of the year. They didn't say torn bicep. They just said a bicep injury, which he was able to okay. finish the game on Sunday playing with. So that's a little bit encouraging that he was able to at least play with it for a period of time on Sunday afternoon. But he's going to be out, which now means Panthers have to find yet another guard as a starter, as they already have Austin Corbett, their starting right guard from last year, on the pup list after he mm -hmm. tore his ACL. The last time they played the Saints back in January, he's hopefully going to be back at some point 
in the middle part of the season. But now the Panthers are going to have to slot in either Cade Mays, Nash Jensen, the US undrafted free agent out of North Dakota State, or the veteran Justin McCray, who was awful in the preseason, didn't even make the initial 53-man roster. So the Panthers dealing with a serious injury at corner and in the interior of the offensive line. And that's definitely not what you want to see. And also, no word just yet on DJ Chark, who missed week one, and whether right. he's going to play on Monday night. So that's what's going on in Carolina. What's going on with the Saints after they got that win against the Titans uh, on Sunday afternoon? Yeah, so far, fingers crossed, knock on wood, mostly staying healthy. They have lost um, you know, Peyton Turner for at least some portion of the season. Uh, a large part of the season going to be dealing with a dislocated toe injury, turf toe as I, like the worst name for an injury ever. It just really plays down like what that injury actually is. But I think mean, outside of that, yeah, right. <laughs> yes. uh, and so a, a very, you know, so far a healthier roster going in than what we've seen from the New Orleans Saints in the past. Uh, but I, I think the biggest story for them going in is, was it just beginner's luck for Derek Carr? I mean, they got a good game out of him, 305 passing yards, one touchdown, one interception, but top five in passing yards across the NFL against a, a tough front and a tough defense with the uh, Tennessee Titans, particularly on their defensive line and their pass rush. Carolina's defensive line and pass rush also extremely talented. So I think you're going to get a real opportunity here to see if what Derek Carr showed you he can be within this New Orleans Saints offense week one can be replicated or moved forward because certainly there's some things to fix there or if it all kind of comes crashing down. I, I think it's going to be more so one of the latters than the former, but I, I do think that that's one of the biggest question marks going into this game is what Derek Carr and the New Orleans Saints offense look like for a second week as opposed to just the first time out. Are Saints fans really holding their breath on Derek Carr? We, we talked about this when we did our yeah. season preview of NFC South, and it was unanimous that Derek Carr was the best quarterback. Now, I guess it was unanimous because – well, Desmond Ritter, we saw four games from him last year. So far, I wasn't impressed from what I saw on Sunday. Bryce Young, right. a rookie. I know a lot of people think he could potentially be the best quarterback in this division. Bryce has still got a long way to go to get to where Derek Carr currently is. And then, hell, Baker went out right. there and, yeah, and come did on. his thing on he Sunday. Did, yeah. so, this is what he does every year, though. Yeah. This is what he does every year. He does, like, two good games, and then it's on us. It's our fault. We all get excited about him, and then he just falls off a cliff again. It's our fault. I, I'm still a big midfield <laughs> fan, even though things didn't work out in Carolina. I like him. And, and I, I'd said the Panther fans, and I've said to anybody, like, he actually got an offseason this time around. He gets yeah. a chance. He didn't have much of a chance last year. They brought him in, and he was always going to be the starter. And it's unfortunate how it worked out. Now, was he going to be the long-term answer in Carolina? Absolutely not. So it was time to right. move on. But I I'd still think Derek Carr will be good for the Saints. I still have them favored to win the NFC South. And Sunday – it seemed like it was encouraging for him to put up that kind of yardage on uh, the Titan secondary where I know Kevin Byard is one of those underrated, one of the better players in the league time. that a lot of people don't know about for whatever reason. Well, I guess because he plays for the Titans, so that's probably the reason. Yeah, it doesn't help. <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> and that defensive line is really good and, and gave the Saints offensive line a lot of trouble. I expect that Carolina's defensive line will also give the Saints offensive line a lot of trouble. So there will be opportunities here to really find out, like, what we saw from Derek Carr, is that the Derek Carr that is the resilient guy that can go out there and still win you a game and that can have the late game heroics I mean, that big 41 yard pass to Rashid Shahid. I'm asking less questions about Derek Carr than I think most are, but I do think that that's still kind of the biggest thing going in is can they repeat? Can they win again? And will it continue to happen? Uh, speaking of the trenches. That, along with uh, a big-time name that, that Julian just mentioned, J.C. Horn, those guys factor into our matchups that can decide this game. That's what we're going to get to next as we continue on with this Locked on Panthers, Locked on Saints crossover episode here as a part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked on Panthers and Locked on Saints brought to you on this crossover Thursday edition by Jace Medical. Look, you want to be prepared. I, I you, uh, Julian, I tell people here all the time when I'm talking about Jace that here in New Orleans, where you have weather that can pop up at any point, hurricane season, all that. Now you're starting to see it over East and Seaboard. You can't even escape it. There's so many things to be prepared for and to make sure you have what you need. And you know, everybody's kind of got their own preparedness thing. Here's something I want you to add to your prepared, you know, being prepared for these things. Uh, uh, uh kind of kit and collection. It's the Jace case. The Jace case comes with. Five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use that can help you have peace of mind in fighting against 
plus different types of infections. You definitely want to have something like this in your home. So here's how you can get one. And you're going to save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical. And you're going to save an additional $20 just by using the promo code Locked on at checkout, jacemedical.com. That's J A S E medical.com. Promo code locked on. Go and check it out today. All right, everybody, continuing on with our crossover Thursday edition, Locked on Panthers, Locked on Saints. We thank all you everydayers out there making us your first listens of the day every day. Uh, Julian, let's get to these big old matchups that could end up deciding this game. You kind of already alluded to one with some health concerns going on for that Carolina Panthers defense. What's that big matchup that you're going to be watching on Monday night? Yeah, Panther fans, uh, let me know if you've uh, seen this play out before. J.C. Horn gets injured. C.J. Henderson comes into the game, then immediately gives up a big passing play. Yeah, you saw it last year against Tampa Bay. You saw it the year before in his first game against Dallas when he gave up a touchdown to Mari Cooper. And then you just saw it on Sunday where he was called for – which I really felt was a phantom defensive pass interference call. Kyle <laughs> yeah, there Pitts. were a lot of those this week. <laughs> but either way, Kyle Pitts, I think legal play, makes a catch, and puts, his, and puts the Falcons in position to end the game there to win 24-10. C.J. Henderson can't be relied on. And now that J.C. Horn mm. is out, the Carolina Panthers are back in the same familiar, precarious situation where their defensive backs, primarily really their cornerbacks, are down their best player. And now mm. in a situation where all the teams in the league that have a capable passing offense, and apparently even the ones that don't in the same in the uh, Falcons can go after CJ Henderson and maybe even Troy Hill, who's going to step in there as well to yeah. fill in for JC Horn. Dante Jackson, he's had his moments. He's not a number one corner, but he can be a solid number two. And he's also dealt with his own health issues. And I had said this before the season. I didn't feel good saying about this because I am always going after people who are like, oh, this guy got hurt. Forget him. Y'all, they're not trying yeah. to get hurt. It's bad right. luck. It's <laughs> yes. unfortunate that it happens. Like JC Horn had Jeremy Chin run into him last year and break his wrist right before the biggest game of the season. Is that on him or is it just – I don't know, football. So football happens, right. and it's it's unfortunate to see that injury to J.C. Horn, who is going to a big year where they got to figure out where they want to give him the fifth-year option, which I would think probably not going to happen now after three straight years of having a serious injury. We're not quite sure how long he's going to be out, but we're looking at the Saints wide receivers. Now that Michael Thomas is finally healthy, Chris Olave, oh my goodness, he's amazing. He I love him. Wish he was a <laughs> Panther and not a Saint. Having to go up against those two with Dante – then C.J. Henderson or Troy Hill, like that's the matchup I'm really looking at. The Panthers need to get some pressure on Derek Carr to help the secondary out because that's really the best way to help a secondary yep. is to be able to get pressure on a quarterback, uh, particularly a guy like Derek Carr. But that's the matchup I'm looking at because I'm concerned about the Carolina Panthers' ability to be able to stop some of those chunk plays and stop two really good wide receivers in Michael Thomas and Chris Olave on Sunday afternoon. Or, sorry, Monday night. Monday night, prime time for those Carolina Panthers. I, I got I to gotta give you a little bit of grief, just a tiny little bit of grief. No, You're just gonna leave Rashid Shahid out of the conversation. The the Rashid I Shahid am. out of the yes. conversation. Number twenty two. You're just gonna leave him out of yeah. conversation entirely, I, Julian. I only respect Buckeye wide receivers. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, look, if you got a rule, you got a rule. If you got a rule, you got a rule. No, the the Weber State alum doesn't move the needle for you. No, look, Rashid Shahid's another one of those guys that's gonna get mixed in a lot. Expect him to be another big focus in this game. Uh, Chris Olave went over 100 yards last week. Dennis Allen basically told us he wouldn't be surprised to see a different New Orleans Saints wide receiver go over 100 yards the following week. He wasn't specifically talking about the Panthers. He just means like they're going to spread the ball around. There's not really ever going to be a indicated one, number one guy that's the same games one through 17. They're going to kind of move this around a lot. And so, you know, that's another guy to where if, if you're already thin at the secondary, the Saints being three deep at wide receiver in terms of guys that they trust uh, makes a big difference going up against like a banged up secondary like that. So that'd be another guy just, just to watch out for. Um, okay. For the Saints matchup wise, it, it comes down to exactly what you just mentioned, that symbiotic relationship between secondary and defensive line like coverage and pass rush the saints have got to do a better job protecting and keeping the pressure off of Derek Carr. now Derek Carr did well uh, under pressure in this last game against the tennessee titans it was like 17 dropbacks according to pro football focus that he was under pressure he was 8 of 13 on those but was also obviously sacked four times in that equation mm -hmm. had another pass that was batted at the line of scrimmage and so when you look at the way that 
Derek Brown just like embarrass Chris Lindstrom all throughout that Falcons game last week. Brian Burns coming back and saying like, hey, I'm not missing any more. You know, I'm not missing any games and all of this stuff. Those are things that should. Yeah, no, it's all about that. It's all about that. Um, but those are things that should put a little bit of concern and fear in the minds of Saints fans, because that is a very talented front four. It's a very t- I mean, you look at uh, Frankie Louvu as well. I mean, that's a very talented yeah. front, you know, as a whole. And so I don't mean to diminish it to just one level, but either way, the pass rush has to be. I don't want to say neutralized, but at least minimized as much as possible in order to be able to take advantage of those injuries in the secondary, give Derek Carr the opportunity to take some of those shots. There were a lot of those open routes downfield that were present, but that he didn't have the time to take advantage of. He was good at kind of taking what's available to him, but you you want to get past just one touchdown in a game, although the Saints should have had two touchdowns in this last game. But you want to get past just relying on field goals, especially with an undrafted free agent rookie kicker coming in and kicking outdoors in a place where the Saints have not really been super successful (laughs) kicking uh, at Bank of America Stadium. You want to avoid all that. And so protecting Derek Carr is going to be huge. I mean, the Saints haven't been successful winning at Bank of America Stadium lately. As of late. Yeah, 100%. The the Panthers have not been good, but they have... Taking the Saints behind the woodshed back-to-back early season games. I think well, yep. last year was either week two or three. Uh, the, I know two. the year prior was a week two game. So it's been an early uh, tilt between these two teams two. the last mm-hmm. couple of seasons here in Carolina where it has not gone well for the Saints. But I've always felt quarterbacks are important, but mm-hmm. D-lines win games. And yep. if the Carolina Panthers can get after Derek Carr – and be able to force them into mistakes and to be able to potentially, you know, get them behind the chains and wreak havoc all game long. That is how they can win this game on Monday night. Cause I, I just don't have confidence in CJ Henderson and, and Troy Hill. I, I'm not familiar with your game. So I really don't know what he's going to provide for the Carolina Panthers really on Monday night until I really see what he gets to do uh, against the Saints wide receivers. But I do know what Derek uh, Brown can do. And oh. getting to see him get a sack on Sunday was encouraging because I felt like going into the year, this was finally going to be the year where we get to see the mm-hmm. pass rusher Derek Brown that we have not seen in his first three seasons in Carolina. And Todd Wash, the new defensive line coach here in Carolina, said back in June during OTAs that that was one of the things that he really wanted to work with um, mm. with, with Derek Brown. We saw it already week one. Brian Burns, just pay the man his money. Give him his money. Came a, Stop playing. Strip sack in the first three plays of the game. Come on. Hey, what, what are we How, doing? Could you imagine being Brian Burns in that moment? Like you're fighting for a contract extension three plays into the game. You show him and you're like, look, there it is. This is why I'm here. And I'm honestly thinking now that I, I don't know whether they're going to get that deal done. I was listening to Jonathan Jones, who um, is a CBS mm-hmm. Sports Insider. And now that Burns is playing, because every time, if he doesn't play, it's about $900,000 that they can uh, find him. Or like see, he loses that game check. I don't know if he's going to be willing to lose a game check at this point in time. So in right. a way, he's a little bit lost some of that leverage that he has. Yep. The Panthers, they didn't trade him. Like They need to go ahead and pay him. They know what his value is. They just don't want to do it. But I'm not worried about Brian Burns getting after the passer. Frankie Lou it was encouraging to see him mm-hmm. get a sack as well on Sunday after having seven last year and even shy Tuttle. So they, they got to get some pressure. Yeah. And that was yeah, a question a mark bit of a revenge going game the situation going. <laughs> yeah, I, I had some I had some questions about whether they could have a good enough pass rush. And to see him get four sacks in that first half, that was good. Now they got to be able to have the pressure throughout the game, and that's something they definitely have to do to help out those uh, corners uh, in the secondary on Monday night. That's a great point. Derek Carr sacked four times in the first half against Tennessee Titans and zero times during the second half. And that might have been the difference in that game, right? Like you give up the yeah. opportunities late in the game. That's going to be the thing that's going to end up having a lasting impact for sure. Uh, Trevor Pinning struggled, gave him some help. We'll see if they'll be able to do that. But definitely the trenches and uh, in and then the symbiotic nature with the coverage with against these receivers in the trenches on both sides, right? Like the Saints got to be able to get pressure too. But you started talking about the things that are going to lead to victory for the uh, Carolina Panthers. That's what we're going to look at next. What's going to lead to a win for Carolina? What's going to lead to a win for the New Orleans Saints? Got that coming up for you as we continue on with this crossover edition of Locked on Panthers, Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Ross, I'm not the biggest fantasy guy anymore after I won my two championships. I've kind of retired recently, but there are times where I decide to dabble. And when I do, I go over to our friends, Price Picks, our sponsor here for Crossover Thursdays and Locked On NFL. Price Picks is the most fun you'll have, winning up to 25 times your money this football season. I promise you that. You just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. Test your skills on Price Picks this football season. It's the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, Guys, you can turn $10 
and two hundred and two two hundred and fifty dollars with just a few taps. That's that's nice. Price fix is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than sixty seconds, so not time consuming at all. Quick withdrawals, easy game plan, and an enormous selection of players and stab types that are what makes Price Picks the number one again number one daily fantasy sports app. Go to PricePicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That's PricePicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. All right, everybody, wrapping up this crossover Thursday edition, Locked on Panthers, Locked on Saints. Julian, we're taking a look now at what it is that's going to lead to a victory for each of these teams. We appreciate all you everydayers out there making us your first listen of the day every day. Uh, Julian, why don't you kick us off? What do the Carolina Panthers need to walk away with a dub on Monday Night Football? Not just be in primetime, but win in primetime. Well, it would be nice if they were healthy. That would certainly yes, that would help. help them that would help <laughs> win uh, on Monday night. Uh, but a couple of things I'm looking at, and for my listeners, uh, Keys to Victor, I'll be giving that to you tomorrow. We'll elaborate mm-hmm. on a little bit more of the things we're about to talk about right now here with Russ. But first off, and I pretty much say this every single game, you got to protect your quarterback. Yeah, and especially now that Austin Corbett's still on pup. He's not going to be there at right guard. Chandler Zavala, maybe he stays at right guard. Maybe he moves over to left guard with his friend, Iki Aquanu, who they played at NC State together. And it's right. good for the Panthers to have that chemistry, albeit it was five games that they actually played together at State. But let's not, let's not get too caught up in that. They have plenty of practice time. They're friends. I think, in part, that's why Zavala's even here in Carolina, because of that potential connection. And there were thoughts that Zavala was coming in to compete with Brady Christensen for that left guard spot before Zavala started off training camp on the pup list. So it's Mm. possible that now he holds down that job for a long time if Christensen's pec injury is a season-ending injury or something that keeps him out for an extended period of time past the minimum four-week requirement once a player goes on IR. But you're going to have to add in likely Cade Mays, who's a second-year player who's never started a game in the NFL, or Nash Jensen, the undrafted free agent at North Dakota State, who was inactive last week, healthy scratch, and has never played in the NFL. Or you play Justin McCray, who's an absolute liability in the preseason. So we'll see what the Panthers do there, but they got to find a way to be able to protect Bryce Young, give him a chance, because he has to have a chance that they're going to be able to win the game on Monday night and be able to establish a passing game. That's the second thing. Establish mm-hmm. a passing game. Oh, yeah. Eight receptions, 15 targets, 63 yards. That's what the Panthers wide receivers did on Sunday in that loss to Atlanta, Ross. That's unacceptable at every level of football. Like in high school, it's unacceptable. In (laughs) peewee, that's unacceptable. Well, (laughs) I guess it depends on how old you are. But it's not acceptable at the NFL level for your wide receiver core to play like that. And I get it. DJ Chark was out. Adam Thielen, I question how healthy he was with the ankle that popped up on Wednesday as he was limited last right. week, then didn't practice on that Thursday, but did play on Sunday. So I question his health. Terrace Marshall, he had been out with the back injury. You could see that him and Bryce Young, they weren't on the same page. Terrace mm-hmm. had quit on a route, though, according to Robert Smith, who was on the Fox broadcast. They have to establish a passing game. That was a thought that it would be better this year even Mm -hmm. though I seriously and I still do question the wide receivers and whether they are capable of consistently making the kind of plays that can help this offense be balanced this upcoming Mm -hmm. season. So we'll see how that works out. And then defensively, I've talked about it with the corners, JC Horn being down into Troy Hill, CJ Henderson, next man up, as they like to say, sure. They have to avoid giving up chunk plays through the air. They cannot allow Michael Thomas. Well, it's not like he's really going to be doing that. He likes to run slants a lot. That's kind of the rub here. In Stop Carolina. it. He literally opened the game with a 25-yard <laughs> go-round. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I had to do the typical know, Panther know, fan, low-hanging flute, <laughs> captain slant, Michael Thomas. I think he's excellent. The guy, like, what, he set a receiving yard record in the NFL. So maybe we can kind of cut that out a little bit. But Chris Olave, we did see last year in this game, at Bank right. America Stadium, where he did hit a chunk play. And the Saints hit him last week. They can't allow him to do it. And, and your friend from Weaver State aware, who, who I apparently should be <laughs> hey, you're, concerned hey, don't, about don't as well. Don't pretend like you didn't remember. Don't pretend like you didn't remember. You got it. You, you got it right. Weaver State. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, we were <laughs> out there in uh, it's an uh, no, it's not in Ogden, Utah. It's somewhere out there in Utah. It is, yeah, but it is, but it is in Utah. See, you know, you knew, I knew. Well, you knew. a lot of people, a lot of my listeners are North Carolina Tar Heel fans, and I'll never forget what happened that one time oh. in the NCAA tournament where some uh, oh, yes, guy from Weber course. State went off. So, yes, of course, that was my first entry to Weber State. I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> All right. So for me, for new, I love, I mean, obviously, yes, those, those are big things. And, and, and you can really just kind of flip all those things that Julian just mentioned and say the, the key to the saints winning comes down to not letting those things happen. Right. And stopping those things. So, but, but I am with you on protecting the quarterback. Same thing for Derek Carr. We, we discussed that. I think that one little nuance to that's very different from <laughs> There's a lot of nuances that are very different from Bryce Young and Ryan Tannehill, but bear with me for a moment. The, the, uh, one of the big nuances in terms of the difference between Bryce Young and Ryan Tannehill is that Ryan Tannehill, you can give him some running lanes in terms of you know getting pressure on him, right? You can over-pursue a little bit if you need to. You can give him an escape pattern because he's not that guy. Bryce Young is that guy as a runner. So because of that, you have to be a little bit more mush rush uh, if you're the New Orleans Saints. You're not going to be able to over-pursue on the outsides and give him those lanes of the C-gap between the guard and center to just be able to tuck it and run. Those are things that we know that Bryce Young can do and should be very comfortable doing. Uh, so you have to be careful about that. So you want to reduce those escape paths and those rush lanes. So don't be surprised, Saints fans, if the New Orleans Saints in this game with Look, they finished with uh, 23 pressures against the Tennessee Titans. If they finish with around 10 to 12 pressures against the Carolina Panthers, don't be super surprised by that because it's not necessarily all going to be about getting after Bryce Young. You're going to want to get that pressure up the middle, kind of you know test him right in his face. You're going to want to try to do those things, but you're not going to want to over-pursue on the outside and give him those rush lanes. So that could end up having a big impact on what the pass rush looks like for New Orleans going up against Bryce Young as well as going up against Ryan Tannehill, which are very different players. And I think that for New Orleans, the last thing for me is getting the run game. Like, was that the understatement of the century that Ryan I, Tannehill and, and Bryce I, Young? I don't. I don't know if I appreciate the Ryan Tannehill slander that he's not that guy who can run. He was a wide receiver. He's not anymore. For, he was a wide receiver for a period of time back in college. Like for a period athlete. of time back in college. In it's 2023. Ryan Tannehill he's ain't, ain't making you guy. hurt on the ground. He ain't making you hurt on the ground. Not the way that Bryce Young is. Let's be real. Let's be real here. All right. That's that's the comparison. Not just in general. Not just in general. Look at you come into the defense of Ryan Tannehill. Somebody right. besides his mother has to. So I love I, it. I have to, man. I used to cover the Titans. <laughs> I, you, you, you're That's talking right. about my city, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing that I want to look at for New Orleans when it comes to this is establishing their run game. Julian, they, they established a run game. 27 rushes last week. It just wasn't a very good run game. 2.6 yards per carry. That cannot be the situation here against Carolina. A part of mitigating some of that pass rush is going to be keeping them honest. And if they can pin their ears back and know that you're going to be in passing situations because you can't move the ball on the ground, that's going to be big. So you got to commit to the run game, even if it sucks, or it's got to not suck. So it's got to be one of those two. And either way, you have to commit to it. So I think establishing the run game has to be big for New Orleans this week as well. And Carolina gave up five yards per carry uh, last yeah. week uh, against the Falcons. And I mean, that's what Atlanta wants to do anyways. Mm -hmm. And it's not like the Panthers were all that concerned about getting beat with the pass game until well, I guess they did get beat with the pass game <laughs> on that one instance in the game. But that one instance is a lot better than the potential multiple instances uh, come Monday night when they play against the, the Saints team where I, I feel like the offense has to feel rejuvenated now that they're mm -hmm. We talked about it earlier. It Was it real? Was it not real? The Saints – finally have a quarterback as long as he stays healthy that can get those wide receivers the football and I, I guess it's a good thing that that's happening and that Chris Olave and Michael Thomas aren't being completely wasted anymore but right whatever <laughs> I guess you can appreciate that a little bit <laughs> to, your, to your chagrin um all right, Julian, let's wrap up here with predictions. You and I aren't really the biggest guy on guys on score predictions, but so let me ask it ask you this way. What do you what do you think are the Panthers' chances of getting a win at home on Monday night football this week? I guess the best way for me to break it down, like going into the season, I felt like Carolina was going to be one and one after the first two weeks. And I told Aaron last week, Aaron Freeman of Locked On Falcons, that I Felt like the Falcons game is probably the most likely loss because I had no idea what to expect from the Panthers team with all the injuries, a new right. scheme, yeah, I get and that. all that. We barely got to see them in the preseason. So they went out, they played worse than I thought they would play, uh, but again, didn't have much expectations. Anyways, I felt like coming back Monday night would be the chance for them to win. And when I really looked at it, 
I felt like one and one is most likely, and I probably would handicap as like a 50% chance for that to happen. Then oh and two, which I'd give probably 45 percent, and then five and then five percent was like two and oh. I didn't think they're gonna go two and yeah, oh. yeah. And of course, that's not on the table. And I suppose there were three other scenarios where they could have tied. I, I we're sure. not gonna talk about that. Um <laughs> I, I can see them winning this game, but the, the matchups they concern me with the offensive line and the questions there, the secondary, just the injuries and whether the passing game can get going. I can still see Carolina winning it. It's the NFL. It's only a three you point spread right now. And at, mm-hmm. not too long ago, the Panthers were actually a favorite. And if you look at some places, they might still be a money line favorite for this game on Monday. So I, I can see him winning, uh, but it's going to be difficult having to overcome those injuries and still a, a very green at certain of like team trying to understand what they're being asked to do on offense and defense. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 hear, I hear you on that one. And these divisional games are super hard to project, super hard to predict. When you look at, Fan duel right now, Saints favored minus two and a half. It's not that big of a spread. I think maybe you you can say that they're overcoming the three-point home deal. I don't know how real that is in Vegas. Uh, but for me, I, I think I give the Saints about an 80% chance of winning this game. Like they should win this game and it should be a comfortable one, especially with the new injuries and the health things that Carolina is dealing with. But we've watched New Orleans not be able to take advantage of injuries, particularly on offensive lines before and things like that. So they have to get that taken care of. But I do give the Saints an opportunity to win here and I think that this should be their game here on Monday Night Football and maybe a little bit of a return to glory in terms of their prime time you know presence because the prime time juju or voodoo that used to be there for New Orleans has not been there here as of late so hopefully we start to see that change um, for the Saints and for Saints fans. All right, Julia, super fun. Um, You've got keys to victory tomorrow. I've got the game plan Mm -hmm. tomorrow. Tell the people a little bit about what you got coming up. Yeah, just got keys to victory. Going to talk about the uh, the three keys. I mean, they might be some of the ones that you've heard, but they're something going to talk about a lot more. Uh, give some updates on what's going on injury wise. Uh, mm-hmm. Injury report did not come out on Wednesday because the Panthers will be out there again on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we'll have an yep, injury report, better understanding what's going on. So we'll talk more about some of those things and other things to look at uh, with the game, and hopefully on Monday as. Getting thrown off my routine here, Ross. Usually a reaction show on Monday. Going to have to figure out what to say. Probably going to have a guest on. I'd like to have somebody on to break down the Monday night matchup. So keys to victory tomorrow. And then on Monday, likely uh, a friend of the show to break things down. Love that. Love that. Over on Locked on Saints tomorrow, we're going to keep our usual schedule going into the game plan. How do the New Orleans Saints beat the Carolina Panthers? That's what we're going to do. We're going to try to draw the game plan up. And then on Monday, just more news and notes and everything, kind of the last minute preparedness, get you ready uh, for that game. So lots of good stuff coming up here on Locked on Panthers, Locked on Saints, and across the Locked on Podcast Network. We appreciate you very much for joining us for another crossover Thursday edition here presented by prize picks if you need anything else from julian council at julian council on twitter x whatever uh, at ross jackson for me over on your favorite social media and we look forward to being here back with you again with our fresh episodes here on friday part of the lot podcast network your team every day